Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Reverend Donna Serafina. I'm a spiritualist reverend. The reason I named my channel Psychic Reverend Donna Serafina is because I know that most people don't know what spiritualism is. Spiritualism is a religion mostly based on Christianity in which we believe it is a gift to communicate with spirits, spirit guides, and angels. I'm doing this map time presentation today so that you can see clearly in your mind and get a spatial perspective of where the students lived compared to where Brian Kohlberg lived and the side streets and routes that he took home where he may have hidden things related to his crime such as clothing and the weapon and any trophies he took. Around noon though even though he took an hour to get home when it should only take 10 minutes, it's clear that he stopped somewhere. But it gets even more configured because around noon he left his house and he went to Clarkston and Lewiston, Idaho, and then Johnson, Idaho. And there was a three hour period in Johnson, Idaho, where he turned off his cell phone. So we're gonna look at all these places in the map time potential places where Brian may have hidden trophies from his crime. Because when I was doing the reading, he didn't, he considered the knife a trophy. And he wanted even the blood left on it. And I know he, you know, it's widely presumed and rumored that this Papa Rogers was one of his many fake profiles where he was taunting people on various social media platforms. Um, but it's not proven. And even if it is, that's not to say he's going to tell the truth about what he did, especially considering it's trackable where he went. Um, because he was saying there on his fake profile, oh, the killer melted down the knife and stuff like that. And what I saw was quite the opposite. He revered it. It was a trophy for him. And he even wrapped it in cloth without washing it off. So he could revisit it. And about, it felt like, so in mediumship, time and space is kind of hard. It felt like it was only five feet away, but I saw him bury a jar and it felt like there was a body part in that jar because I re remember wondering, well, does he have formaldehyde? Like, what did he put in there to preserve this? But I, again, I was behind him and I purposely wasn't trying to be like right up in it. And I do feel like I know what body part, but I, I'm not going to go there and say these kind of things. Just suffice to say that he buried them a little bit separately. So if somebody found one, they might dismiss it or disregard it. It, whereas if they were buried right next to each other, somebody would know they were connected. Okay, so with that, we're going to start. But before we start, please um, stop for a second and make sure you're subscribed to my channel. And also hit the little... His parents know there's something off about him. His parents knowing. And also... This is really interesting. There's another read or video I put up and I was talking about Brian's mother is in danger of her life. I was talking about Brian being at their house and there, okay, so he had a larger jar with him when he hid the knife, but I saw like a little jar, like a little bigger than baby food or about the size of baby food. He had brought blood with him and he put it on himself. He was hiding in the room and he was you know, doing what people do privately sometimes. Uh, he put, he didn't put a cover it. He put a tiny little bit and just that enough was enough to stimulate him. And also that he really had killing on his mind and that if his mom were to confront him, he might actually just murder her as well. And it was this severe warning. And then it was like the next day or the day after that, in the middle of the night when they raided his house and arrested him. So that was a real relief to me because I really felt this woman was in danger. Brian's mother is interesting. Uh, we don't know much about her yet. The only thing that's out is a newspaper clipping that she wrote in sympathy of Ted Bundy um, to a local newspaper. 
And it was basically against the death penalty. So it's interesting that Brian went to a death penalty state and then tried to um, do what would be, uh, at the very least, the beginning of being a serial killer if he had gotten away with it. And I don't know, I haven't done any readings to see if he had past history of any other murders or not. People keep asking me that. Um, I, ha I also did a reading on December 5th, and I only listened to it once. And so I'm going to go ahead and listen to that again and just see if there's any little clues that are still relevant that I could put up for you. So stay tuned to my channel for that. Okay, so we're going to start with um, the fact that here is Google Earth. And I'm going to show you on here if you can see in relationship to Pullman and where what I 1122 King Queen King Road so in cl clip one this is what I said in my original reading which I uploaded November 22nd I did the reading on November 18th but the original reading I uploaded, I was talking about him moving his car around and parking in a couple different places, and that goes perfectly with the affidavit. I'm going to play this clip for you about my reading, and the clips aren't the whole clip, so you really need to go back into the reading because I'm just like slicing off a piece to show you that I was seeing him moving his car around too. I saw him park you know, across the street and up a little. Then I saw him move around the corner. And in the affidavit, it says he actually circled the house three times or went back and forth in front of the house three times before finally parking. So that does go with what I say. And on these screenshots where I put the little red marks, that's where I saw him park. It feels like he drove his car there and it feels like he parked it across the street and down two or three houses facing away from their house and he doesn't feel scared. He doesn't feel worried about standing out or someone seeing him or it feels like he drives a small car too. I have a tiny bit of spirit energy, not huge chills. Okay, let me just, I'm not sure if they're trying to show me he went out, parked a little farther, like up the street and around the corner. Or... But if you were facing their house and you, you know, put your arm to the right. That's the way he parked. And then around that first corner. The next issue that I want to address is the issue of the stalker. So the description of when I saw Brian approach one of the girls the first time could have been, a, you know, there could have been something else going on, but this is just, I'm seeing, this is my first time seeing Brian in the reading, right? And I'm in the, I said, I feel like I'm in the downtown Main Street area. Now, at that time, I hadn't even looked at a map. And I said, I feel like one of the girls, which I, I said the round face one, I believe, I thought was Kaylee. But, I'm you know, I really don't know because on the first reading, I just, like, look at a picture and then go in my room and meditate and ask for guidance and ask to be shown what occurred. But one of the girls was sitting there on a bench and where the bench is surrounded tree. And I have later determined that's most likely a place called Friendship Park, which is about a block and a half from where Maddie and Zana worked at the Mad Greek. But there are benches around that area. There's also a circular bench at, at the sorority where Kaylee actually was previously living. And there's one uh, near the Safeway near a baguette place in the... Um, mall and the inside the mall there so like a tree with a bench around it in there okay they're showing me one of the blonde girls now i can't rule i i can tell them apart a little bit i think it's the one that has a little rounder face um and she's doing something so i'm just gonna follow her a minute and i'll tell you she's they're just showing me her but we're walking somewhere we're in, we're in that main street area of that little town I'm seeing a guy talking to her. I can't rule. I, I can tell them apart a little bit. I think it's the one that has a little rounder face. Um, and she's doing something. So I'm just going to follow her a minute and I'll tell you. She's, they're just showing me her. 
but we're walking somewhere. We're in, we're in that main street area of that little town. I'm seeing a guy talking to her, and he's about, he's quite a bit taller. I mean, she sits on a bench, or it really feels like if there's a tree, and I'm getting chills on my legs, if there's a tree that has a bench surrounding the tree, like, you know how they put those half-round benches around trees sometimes? He's taller, he's taller, and... He's taller, and, um, because this guy seems like he has, um, like if he was like six feet tall or something like that, you know, a, a bigger build, and she's not really interested in him because she's, so it's not that, it doesn't feel like she knows him, it doesn't feel like she's super interested in talking to him, she's definitely not interested in going out with him. Oh, he has brown hair, in fact... He, he looks different than the one that got killed, but he's larger size like that. And his hair is a little bit, it might have a wave in it, but and it's thick, but it's... And he might be a little older. Okay, I have chills about that. He's a little older. So she doesn't totally believe... She's like wondering if he really even goes to college or not or something. He's wearing a black sweatshirt or a hoodie or black. Now I'm seeing the front of the house again. So, can't be 100% sure, but listen to the clip and see what you think. Now, also, note the description I gave of this first time I saw the man. In fact, I even say, this is daytime when I'm seeing this, but I'm seeing the grub truck off in the, off in the distance, and it's dark, and I'm seeing the other guy that kept calling Hoodie Guy, right? Everyone kept calling this guy Hoodie Guy, and he was one of the jacks, if you've been paying attention. And I said, I'm differentiating from that guy. It's not the guy I'm talking about. It's not that guy. The guy I'm talking about is about six feet tall. He has brunette hair. He has curly hair. He's around age 30. He's trying to talk to her about these kind of redundant classes, history, etc. that they, they force you to take, um, you know, because that would be a common ground, right? Everybody has to take them. And who I felt was Kaylee was not interested at all in this conversation she was not interested in him she wasn't afraid of him though but she definitely did not know him so what's interesting later is when they connected me into the mind of the killer during the reading when i was in the house with him i said i feel like i've been in here before and he even knew which rooms to go into and i even talked about how he skipped the one room that turned out dylan was in if you put me in the mind of the killer and then i get some spirit energy and then i'm like did you leave town did you leave town and then it's like okay wait i gotta stop because it's better just to let them show and unfold it the way they want Okay, so now I'm going up the side of the house on the right. So if I was standing there in the lower part facing the house and I have strong chills on my legs, I go up the right, I go up the hill, and I go in the back way like that, and I got big chills on my legs. I I'm just going to go with what I feel like and maybe check with the facts after because I feel like I I'm, I'm with the killer and I'm going up the side of the house on the right. And in the back sliding door. And so he has this moment where he knows he's in. And he's he's taking his time. He seems to know when he goes. He knows. I feel like he's been there before. Like he, he knows. He thinks for a second of looking for more, but he, he stops for a second and there's no noise. There's nobody getting up. So he just waits for a few minutes. What happens so he doesn't really get to do his fantasy. So I think she started to wake up or something. So he slit her throat too, just to, um, and then it feels like the other female, her friend, um, she wakes up and says something like, Maddie, are you all right? Or something. So he, he just goes right in there and stabs her and pushes her back into her bed um, or area or back into her room. 
I think he grabs the apple on the way out. Oh, he's going back out onto that patio. And then I see him going down the stairs. Okay, so he came in the patio. He came in the sliding door. Okay, this guy's really gross. Like, he actually uses his bloody knife to cut a piece of apple and put it in his mouth. And then I see his genitals again. So somehow it gives him a sexual turn on. This guy from Missing 411 comes in. And I maybe they're trying to show me that he had his look, his coloring or something is like that. Yeah, and I'm getting chills on my legs. So see how you can't really tell what nationalities are mixed in with a lot of people, homogenous Americans. Um, <laughs> it's just... He has dark hair. He, he looks a little like that. I got chills on both legs. He looks like David Paulides. He's similar in looks to David Paulides. I got big chills on my leg. But of course, he's not David Paulides. It's just that he looks like that. Uh, 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 coloring wise. And he has no remorse or anything like that. No, no remorse. So it's really interesting. And I'm still going to argue with the general presumption that he went straight upstairs and then came back to deal with Ethan and Dana. I don't believe that's the case. I think he went because the reason I think this is because it's in my reading and it was really, really graphic and clear. Um, you'll have to listen to it. But I saw him go to the room on the left first. Then I saw him skip purposely skip that room that Dylan was in. Then I saw him go upstairs. Then. I, I kind of feel like the man gets it first. Whatever door he goes in, like the first door. Yeah, I got a little spirit energy that the, the, okay. So he, he opens a door on the left and he sees the guy and his girlfriend sleeping. The guy kind of wakes up and is like, what the fuck or whatever. And, um, he just goes over real quick and just stabs him right in the chest, like, and then stabs his girlfriend right in the chest, like, or chest and abdomen. Um, I, I mean, that, sh that instantly shuts them up, obviously. And then he has their door open just like an inch because he wants to see if anyone heard it or woke up. And he's looking out down the hallway. He's going to, he wants to skip the door that's the closest across from him because he wants to get to the door that's furthest down the hall from this, which is interesting. Because you'd think he'd go to like a door closer. But he knows what, I feel like he knows which rooms they even have. No spirit energy, no spirit energy. Okay. Now Dylan says she saw him come, um, she saw him come out of Zana's room. He could have come back down after murdering those ones upstairs and heard Zana crying and then went back in to finish her off. So I think time will tell, but I'm not letting go of what I saw. What I saw was very clear. There's some things in the reading where I'm not quite sure, or I know that it could be a symbol. For instance, the apple. Washington, I think that's the Washington state fruit is the apple. Apples grow in Washington. The apple farms Washington. It, that could very well be. The bread. Coburger is the largest bread bakery. It's the largest family bread bakery in Europe. And it, they even supply the East Coast of the United States. That's how large they are. And they even have a Wikipedia page. So you, not only can you look up their website, you can look up their Wikipedia page. That's how big they are. So we're going to look on this map. What did Brian do to avoid detection? His route to the King Street house appears that he was attempting to use side streets in order to avoid traffic cameras. However, Note to all criminals, there is now traffic cameras everywhere. So one surveillance camera picks him up at the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive. 
Then he's going westbound on Steiner. Then he takes Ida crosses Idaho State 95 at approximately 3.28 a.m. Number seven. At approximately 4.20 a.m., the white Hyundai Elantra belonging to Brian Koberger was seen leaving the area 4.20 a.m. at a high rate of speed. And he headed up Walenta Drive. So he went that way, and that way goes past the Arboretum, which is why law enforcement was asking for any surveillance cameras in that area as well. So they already had it in the bag as far as knowing who the suspect was. Now, then he goes off of the surveillance cameras. There's no surveillance cameras for a period of time. And then they pick him up again um, when he gets back to Pullman in that city. He took 55 minutes to get home. So clearly he stopped somewhere. This is normally a 10 or 15 minute drive. The police believe that he went down Palouse River Drive, and I'm showing you that on the map. Brian's address or where Brian lives, as I said in my reading. So let's look at where Brian Koberger actually lives and the route he took home. <clears throat> the white Andre Elandra that was seen on surveillance cameras turned out to belong to Brian Koberger. And he resided at 1530 Northeast Valley Road, apartment 201, Pullman, Washington. So I want to play a clip, and this isn't the whole thing. I wish I'd clipped out the entire thing, because I swear I said Valley somewhere in, in these readings. If you find it, you email me or text me or put a comment where, where you find it, the timestamp. Um, but I don't have the time to look. But here's a quick clip where I'm talking about if you face the house and you put your right arm out, and you go across the fields and the fields and the fields towards the other mountains. Um, this is where Brian lives. It feels like he drove his car there and it feels like he parked it across the street and down two or three houses facing away from their house. And he doesn't feel scared. He doesn't feel worried about standing out or someone seeing him or feels like he drives a small car, too. I have a tiny bit of spirit energy, not huge chills. Okay, let me just... I'm not sure if they're trying to show me he went out, parked a little farther, like up the street and around the corner. But if you were facing their house and you, you know, put your arm to the right, that's the way he parked, and then around that first corner. I think where he lives, if you're looking at the house, he lives down off to the right. If you're facing their house, the 1102 house or whatever, he lives to the right of there, down there. They give me big chills on both legs now. Is he live within a couple blocks of them? The chills kind of went away, but he lives to the right. Okay, so um, he lives that way. They keep showing me across, so they, they've done this like three times, and I didn't really say it, but besides living to the right. So here's their house. And then at some point, past everything else, where there's fields or whatever, and you can see mountains across, or giant hills, whatever you want to call them. I do not know the distinction, but whatever. You know, things that rise up out of the ground. Like... Okay, for some reason, I'm not sure the reason, but they show me over there. They show me this. They keep showing So the big question, number 16, is where did Brian hide the knife? So the big question is where did Brian hide the knife? <clears throat> On the same day of the murders, cell phone records showed that Brian left town. And here's a little clip from my reading when I'm saying, did you leave town? You know, on the reading, right? You know what I'm talking about. If you put me in the mind of the killer and then I get some spirit energy and then I'm like, did you leave town? About after, right after the murders, I'm like, did you leave town? Turns out he did. Besides leaving town and going back to Pennsylvania with his father, the day of the murders, he also left town. He left Pullman, and he, he went on a trip, it looks like, for at least about eight hours. Let me tell you about it. So he 
He drove to a place called Lewiston, Idaho, as you can see on the map. Brian's Elantra was picked up by surveillance just driving past this Kate's Cup and Joe. It just turns out that there's a surveillance camera. They're not saying he stopped there and they're not saying he went there, but that, and it looks like this Lewiston and Clarkston are right next to each other because just blocks away is an Albertsons. And so, and then they call that Lewiston, Idaho. It's kind of like almost the same thing because remember Lewis and Clark, if you're not in America, those are people that cross the mountains together. So um, this place is called Lewiston, Idaho, and he's at the Albertsons purchasing unknown items. This is way, way, like look on the map here. It's not anywhere near Pullman or Moscow. Like he drove for a couple hours probably. I don't know how long it takes to get there. But this is around 12.45 p.m. So he is now at the Albertsons. He's buying things. And then he gets back in his car, right? And they see him going through that town. And then they trace him to a place called Johnson, Idaho. So that's a ways. That's towards up in the mountains, up in the boonies, right? Where there's not a lot of people. And he turns off his cell phone for three full hours. What do you think he was doing? You put in the comments. You tell me. Do you want to look up, if you're a sleuther, do you want to look up Johnson, Idaho and figure out if there's any locations where you think he may have hid? If if my reading was accurate, um, that he buried the knife, do you want to look up there on the map and see, are there hunting cabins for rent? Are there little shacks that are just usable by hunters? Um, I felt like there was one at least in the proximity of where all this was and it felt like he put that knife near this small tree like I mean I could see it you know okay so then the last thing we're going to cover so then he finally turns it back on around 8 30 I don't know what time he got home but just figure for eight or nine hours Brian was gone and for three of those hours he had his cell phone turned off he was up to something he didn't want anybody to know where he went and I am surmising this is likely where he hid his knife and his trophies so the last thing that we'll look at is Brian's route to Pennsylvania you know, at first I thought, why would someone drive to Colorado? Because he was picked up, his dad flew into town, and they were going to drive back across the country together. And they drove to a license plate reader, picked him up in Loma, Colorado. And at first I thought, why would someone drive down the country to go there? But then when I look at a map of the whole United States, I see that you kind of at some point drive down anyways, and it's depending on where. So maybe they thought that trip would be more scenic. I don't know. But a license plate reader did pick his car up in Loma, Colorado. And then is widely known, has been widely um, shown on television over and over that they pulled him over twice while he was in Indiana. And that's where he has that wide eye look on his face and keeps saying they're going to Thai food. And, you know, okay. And finally, on December 16th, 2022 surveillance video showed that Coburg's Elantra had made it back to Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, and um, he was at his family home there. Uh, about a week or so later, they, you know, maybe what, ten days later, they were watching, looking for DNA. Brian apparently was very, very careful about putting anything in the garbage. He probably suspected or at least wanted to cover his tracks. But, you know, his father put out his garbage just like a normal person. Once a person puts out garbage in the United States, it's considered public property. So the police are allowed to go and pick up the garbage can, and they were able to find DNA in there from Brian's father. And using the familial DNA, then they were able to determine is like one in a billion or something chances that he wasn't the killer's father. Oh, and this is really interesting. I'm just going to finish with this. 
I did a reading that's su really beautiful. There's not any graphic violence in it, and it was with Zana Kernodal. It was a couple of her friends. And she, Zana, for one thing, she's a really, was, is, uh, just a really nice person, caring person that cares about how everybody feels. And she gave us a couple, kind of what I would almost call foreshadowing, because I had no idea at the time why she was telling us these things, but she was, she was trying to show me the top of um, pants where the snap is, right? And I was joking to the young woman that at my age, because I am 60 years old, so I was joking to the young woman that at my age, I just wear stretch pants, so that's so long ago I forgot what it's called, but, you know, a snap, a button, whatever. Well, it turns out a couple days later when they released the affidavit, the DNA they found at the scene that they talked about in the affidavit was under the snap of the sheath of the knife, which Brian inadvertently left at the scene. I'm also seeing a lot of speculation about how Brian left a sheath at the knife at the scene, right? Because what I saw was in the kitchen, he already had his knife out. Okay, sheaths, a knife, you put them on a belt. I'm going to get my knife. Well, no, I won't. I have a knife. It's not quite that big, but it's one of these large ones. There's no snap to snap it on and off a belt. You have to open your belt and put your belt through it. What I talked about in that first reading was Brian's fantasy sick twisted fantasy or I should say the alleged killers or allegedly Brian um, but the killer's sick twisted fantasy of what he wanted to do to these girls it is entirely plausible with what I saw that he would have opened his belt loop but been unable to make himself let me put it that way he would be unable to uh, perform uh, the gross grotesque disgusting things he wanted to do but it would be entirely plausible at that time with Kaylee and Maddie that the the sheaf would fall off because of that I'm just saying it's something to think about it goes along with my reading I'm not going to play it here because you know at the time when I do those very detailed readings I'm doing them and sending them to law enforcement so that if they recognize things that they're already investigating, they may put at least some, you know, thought, put it on the side burner, like, oh, yeah, she got 50% of what we already know and haven't released to the public, and here's what else she's saying, type of thing. I don't feel the need to repeat it. So you just go back and listen to the first reading. And with that, and then it was like a day or two before... Brian was arrested I put up a clip from a reading and talked about the fact that Brian's mother was in extreme danger of losing her life that um, I knew that she had she had questions or suspicions and thought about bringing it up but that um, I was warning her not to bring it up literally do not bring it up I was saying I was like I can't be more strong and if you are if you suspect your son of doing this, uh, go to the police station, give them your DNA um, right away so they can do a familial DNA test. Or you may end up in the morgue like it was super strong. And I even have chills now, which is confirmation, which is like his mother was in so much danger. And it turns out about 36 hours later, if that, um, from the time I uploaded that little read, was they arrested Brian Kohlberg at his family home in Pennsylvania using familial DNA, although from his father. So thank God that his mother's still alive. Thank God that he didn't slaughter his whole family over there. Um, and also, in my reading, before I even knew who he was, I was saying that his parents know something's wrong with him. And that was a really big theme through there. That doesn't mean they're responsible. It is close to impossible and there's people all over the United States who have children who have one problem or another 
it is close to impossible to get real help. It really is. So there's a limit because of laws of what you can do. So again, not to blame the family, just because they knew that he was something was wrong. I'm sure they were really, really pleased that he was in college and not doing heroin. You know what I mean? You cannot blame the family. So that's the end of my presentation today. And again, this is what I want to say. If you were friends with any of the victims, Zana, Ethan, Maddie, or Kaylee, if you are friends or family or loved ones of those victims and you would like a reading for free, I would be honored to do that for you. And I actually did a reading the other night for a couple of friends of Kaylee's. Um, I haven't uploaded it yet. I'm going to listen to it. I don't know if I will or not because it just kind of felt personal but I haven't listened to it again. So it's like when I don't listen to him, I really don't know what's there. So we'll see how that goes. Again, make sure you're subscribed to my channel. Hit the notification bell. Please hit the thumbs up and leave a comment. All right. I love you all. Let's practice love. Love, love, love. Love our enemies, right? That's a, that's a real skill. <laughs>